I'm a Chabad yeshiva boy, one year after Gimel Tammuz, just accepted into a hotbed <laughs> of anti-Chabad Litvisha, European Litvisha Hisnagdos. The Rosh Hashiva Panovich is still alive. Right. The Litvisha world is celebrating the demise of Lubavitch. And here I am, just plopped into this yeshiva. Welcome to Homesick for Lubavitch, a podcast where we explore Lubavitch identity in the year 2023. My name is Ben Siafson, and I will be your host. Let's begin. All right, thanks for having me here. Um, it's a beautiful town here in Dartmouth really glad that I came up here you know people do these things online or by zoom and I figured from the beginning I wanted to I wanted to do it in person preferably in this in the place where the person lives and helps me understand a little bit where that person's coming from and the life that they live and I think I think the person being interviewed is also more comfortable in the place where they live and the space that they live. So anyway, it's a it's a beautiful town. Thanks for having me. Um, and let's let's uh, let's let's get right into it. Why don't you tell us a little bit about where you grew up, the school that you grew up in? Like, backtrack a little bit yeah. for people that don't know who these people yeah. are. So like, so these are Chabad. These are the boys of their their parents were the Chabad emissaries in Seattle, Washington. Um, these were my friends. We we had a Chabad, an Orthodox Jewish day school that we grew up going to. It was small. My class was always small. The community was small. Um, and, uh, you know, so so on that, in the one hand, it was like a very, like, insulated, you know, growing up. Um, the the Jewish day, the, this Chabad day school, though, was was an interest, it had a, it had a very interesting locale. I believe the Rebbe told them to, to, it should be near the University of Washington. It was on Frat Row. <laughs> and, and I think about it often that imagine my kids went to school on Webster Avenue here in Hanover, New Hampshire, surrounded by all these fraternities. I mean, it's just not the normal place you would put a Jewish day school. And yet that was my experience. Was there ever a reason given? Something about influence. What influencing mean? outwards really yeah you ever said something that that the jewish some... day school should be in a place yeah I, I we'd have to do a deeper dive into yeah, i've never actually thought of that question because but... it's so interesting because because i've told so many people as young adults not to go to university because right. of the influence i mean i guess the, the difference the obvious difference here would be that you weren't going to university you were going right. to school near university but you know it you would think logically that if you don't want people going to college, you want to keep the kids far right. away from college. Right. And yet here... Here we were very much... I mean, I grew up thinking college kids didn't do anything other than drink beer and throw football around. Because it's all I saw. Yeah, frat row, yeah. Um, but I, maybe on, on, some, on some level, it, 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 it sort of had... A, it certainly had an influence on me. So your dad's a scientist. Um, you said you grew up... Like an an all American regular typical American uh, lifestyle, that seems like he didn't run away from his previous lifetime. That mm -hmm. before he became mm -hmm. religious, so you must have known about that part of him. Oh, my parents have never shied away from their from their past. Right. Um, so much so that my father played baseball. My grandfather played semi-professional baseball. And so it was just a foregone conclusion that I would play Little League. And so mm -hmm. I was the first, I'm certainly the first Chabad kid. I might even be the first Orthodox kid in Seattle to play, play Little League. Mm -hmm. And years later, as an adult, I had people living in Seattle telling me that because of me, their kid plays and it, how great it is. And, and um, when I started, I mean, no Kornfelds, none of the Shluchim's kids played. And I don't know what they thought of that. I don't know what they thought of me playing. No one, certainly no one said anything to me. But by the time my, my Little League career was over, um, you know, all my friends were playing Little League. But how did you fit in as a family? So you're in this, mm. you're in this town where, mm. at least at the time, most of the Chabad people living in Seattle 
our shluchim there, because why else would a Chabad or Lubavitch family live in Seattle? I don't think you, it doesn't sound like you guys consider yourself shluchim. No. Yeah, so like, Although my mother was, my mother was the principal of the school. Okay. I think it was a lot harder for my mother than it was for my dad. Mm-hmm. Uh, my dad had his career. My dad was very involved in that. And he was a, as a scientist. And I think my father was more comfortable in his identity as a Baal Shuvah than my mother. I think my mother, um, it took her a long time to be comfortable in that identity. I think mm-hmm. she would have much rather have been a Baal Shuvah, gotten married and moved on Shlifas. I think she would have loved that. You're saying it was harder for her to balance the kind of being in and out at the same time. Like, you know, who am I? Am I am I on shluchis? Am I just a typical... You know, we are in the Sefer Shluchim. You are. We're in Chelek Da... We're in the fourth volume because they added sort of professionals. They added my people like my mother who were... So it's my mother's in there as the principal with her husband and, and her kids. Mm-hmm. Um, Interesting. So I think that was very meaningful for her. Mm-hmm. Um you know, I think, you know, growing up, my mother would s- say to me that her, her dream was that I would be a rub. She always felt like that would be like, that she would have a son that she could call Silas. And, and that was like something very important to her. My father, it was not important to my father. I actually, we can get back to this, but I grew up with the sense that like, I was not going to be a shliach, that this was something that I would not to aspire to that's a difficult life and why would you pick that for yourself and go into business and you know be able to pay for things and you feel like you got that from your father yeah he didn't actively dissuade but there was definitely not a proactive this is something to aspire to right and i imagine also that you're you know you're you're um you're growing up, you're seeing your dad being a professional, probably being decently compensated, right? And a, chi- a child is able to discern, like, mm. there's this way of life and there's this other way mm. of life. And so long as your father isn't, like, negative about his choice and, like, saying, I wish I could be them, you're like, okay. <laughs> no, he, he certainly never talked about, like, right. oh, I wish I could be like, Right, exactly. So, so, like, a child is, you know... We're both parents and everybody knows that children are pretty discerning, right? So it does make sense that, you know, you're seeing these two paths ahead of you. Well, when I, again, I'm jumping in my story a little bit, but when I really started talking seriously about what I wanted to do and and this campus thing, my father, again, did not try to dissuade me. He just wanted me to go in eyes wide open. Uh, interesting. I need you to know the challenges and, and, and what you're going to be up against. Um, so that way you can think about things in a, in a healthier, in a healthier way, um, both in terms of Parnassa and in terms of bringing up children in a place like Hanover, New Hampshire, which is isolating to just not have a big Jewish community. Right. So well, yeah. that probably has a little bit to do with the few years you spent in Denmark. If you want to talk about that a little bit. I mean, your father had to raise you, your parents had to raise you, or were you there? Or you I didn't really siblings? spend much time there. We had other siblings there, I right? I did, I did. So, I mean, they, they, they got their taste of what it's like to be an isolated Shlichus family. Yeah, yeah. But by then I was, I... I so um, talk a little bit about your years, in, or, or you don't remember much of it. No, I do. Uh, um, yeah, so I grew up in Seattle, as I said, and then um, I loved my childhood. I really, I really think I had a, a, a unique childhood. Um I was sad to sort of leave it. Um, so at 14, I was my parents sent me away from home. As I said before, I, I had two, these two best friends that I grew up with. And um, they went to a yeshiva in Detroit. And I ended up going to a yeshiva in Los Angeles. Okay. And uh, my experience in LA was not good. Um, I, for a, a plethora of reasons that I really... I'm uninterested in getting into. Yeah. Um, I will say this in terms of friends from those two years. I mean, it's there's like it's like two or three. Mm. I literally have two or three. Uh, 
there are there are fellow shluchim from those years that I do see, but but they're acquaintances and they're not. Yeah. They're, well, uh, it's a very challenging time of your life, age of your life, to go and make new friends. Sure. Yeah. I was I was a cocky fourteen year old. Um, yeah. Uh, you know, I showed up and and you know when you're fourteen back then it was like how good is your jump shot. And and yours was good. Mine was good, and, and it's not good when there are bigger, older guys in you who you're better than. They don't like that, and that that was not, and I wasn't humble about it. Probably. And people in LA are not pushovers either. Right. Um. So anyway, so that was my two years there, and the second year that I was in LA, my parents moved to Denmark, and the the reason they moved is was for business. My father had a unique opportunity um, to spend three years there. And for tax reasons, it was, it's like the dream come true. It's like Denmark has crazy high taxes. And, but when you leave America, you, they, your tax rate like halves. And so the idea is, but in Denmark, if you spend up to, if you spend more than five years, you got to pay back all the back taxes. So the, the sweet spot is three years. Um, and there was a Kylo, there was a Litvish Kylo there that kind of made it more palatable. There was 10 families. So there was a community there. There was schooling for my sister's. Um, and so my parents wrote into the Rebbe. Now this was after the first stroke. So this is in 1994. Um, it was, they got an answer back to move four days before the second Chav Zion other. So this be, right before the second stroke, which that ended all sort of communication with the Rebbe. And the answer was yes. You know, we have an opportunity to move to Denmark. Should we move to Denmark? And the answer, yes or no? And the answer was yes. The Rebbe nodded his head, yes. Okay. Let me ask you a question. Yeah. Um, based on what you're saying, the difference between your father and your mother, is there any reason to believe that making that kind of choice contingent on the Rebbe's uh, agreement or blessing was coming from your mother and not from your father? or was Or was your father the kind of person who was both very confident in his identity as a professional, but also very kind of typical in the Hasidic way? So it's a very perceptive question. I don't know the answer to it, but I'll tell you what happened four days later that might, or a week later, that might actually shed light on that question, which is a week later, the Kail, there was a scandal, and the Kail upped and left. And my father called my mother and said, I got some bad news. Like, this Kyle is gone. And my mother was not enamored by this news. To the point where she was like, well, that's it. We're not going. And my father's response was, but we have a bracha from the Rebbe. Hmm. So would my father have gone? I think the question is, should, would my father have written? Once you write, you write. I mean, that, that, that's clear. You get an answer, you get an answer. There, had the Rebbe said no, I don't know what would have happened. But what happened directly afterwards is actually quite interesting. And so I've always said, like, my mother's the bigger chassid than my father. But it depends where. Mm -hmm. um, no, he could have also wanted to go there more. And oh, he was, certainly did. Right. So he was looking. But, you know, I'm, I'm not looking. Really, I'm not looking to try to understand your father here, right. because then I would, right. I would go interview him. But it's more the reason I, I think it's important is because, you know, at the end of the day, our identity and our perception of who we are has a lot to do with our parents, sure. even if it's in the sense that we are trying not to be them, right? right, right? right but right. There, you know, as long as there's some kind of relationship there, a lot of who we are is is based on who our parents. Are and were certainly so that's that's why I'm asking that like you, you're growing up clearly in a in a household where there's as a child you're picking up that there's different aspirations and different dreams being projected onto you right that your mother wants you to be a rabbi your father maybe isn't totally against you being a rabbi but would not be unhappy if you chose a, a proper profession in his view right and so that's clearly the the background for who you become. You're growing up with these, and that probably sets up the stage for the next, for the next, um, for, for the next, you know, part of your story when you decide to go on shlichus. And so there's an interesting 
deviation in my story. Okay. Which further complicates it. Drills into this identity, which is um, so I finished my second year in LA. My family has now been in Denmark for a year. And it's sort of, my parents are like, well, we want you closer to home. You know, LA is 9,000 miles from Denmark or whatever it is. Mm-hmm. So, you know, we'd like you to go to Yeshiva in England and, you know, London. And so my father calls the Yeshiva in London and, and they say, we're not taking your son. And it's not nothing to do with me per se, but they had not had a very good experience with the previous crop of boys from LA that year. And my father now begins to panic because what, where is he going to send me? Like, where, what am I, my father, learning is a very important thing to my father. My father, it, you know, he really, that's what he connects to. His Yiddish, you know, he came to Yiddishkeit rationally. Um, and I think Brunois, I remember the conversation about Brunois, but it was like, it, it didn't seem like it was a non-starter. Um, so Manchester. So I, I after the first Gimel Thomas, uh, I flew with you know a guy that I had met, and we we were gonna we were testing out Manchester, and that sounds, that sounds like that sounds pretty sunny. <laughs> <laughs> let's just let's just say it was not it was not good. Um, I didn't want to be there. Hmm. I didn't want to be there. Um, the tone was set from the minute we landed. Um, we're in this taxi and, uh, we get to, we pass, I, I know we're getting close cause I feel the, the, and we pass by this building and every building we pass, I'm like, I hope it's not that building. I hope it's not that building. <laughs> then we pass one particular building. I was like, phew, thank God it's not that building. Like I was, Oh, whoops. We just turns around and pulls into that building. And I was like, Oh no. Like, Oh boy. That, so that's we, pulling me back so vividly. To did you I, study there? No, uh, no. Um, I've heard that about not just here before, <laughs> but I remember when I landed in Argentina, it was the same, it was the same thing. Like, and I went to Argentina cause like, I, I had these like very, very idealistic ideas about it. Like there was a mashpia there. Mm-hmm. I was going to mm-hmm. go there for a, a derech and And I really, mm-hmm. really meant it at the time. I, I was a pretty, you know, spiritual, maybe nutcase you know, <laughs> kind of kid. And I remember we landed in Argentina and like all of this spiritual idealism crashes in the reality of the Sesa airport <laughs> where we're being picked up in this rickety bus from the 1970s. And like, I don't know if you've ever been in Argentina, like you get deeper and deeper into the city and like all you first you see like carts being, you know, horse, horse, horses drawing the, you know, horses, what's it called? The horse drawn cart taking people doing all kinds of funky stuff and <laughs> yeah and it's like all of a sudden we end up in this dreary building and it's like this this is where my spiritual future is going to happen right right anyway so, so yeah. that happened to me so i walk in remember we walked into the building it was the dorm at the time and uh we opened the first door on the right i was actually just sharing the story with a with a really really close friend of mine who who did study there for two years and I was telling him the story and he was just, he was in stitches because mm-hmm. he, it, he knew, he knew this story and we opened this door and it was this big bedroom and it was four o'clock in the afternoon approximately. And the room has blackout shades and it's dark. And we <laughs> open the door and we're trying to like see what this room is. And all of a sudden from under the blanket, this head comes out. <laughs> he just goes, shut the damn door. And puts it back over his head. And I was like, oh God, like where, what, what is going on? There are creatures. He was like a, a creature. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, there was no one there to meet us. There was no rabbi there to be like, you're in this room. Or we had no sort of hadracha. We had no uh, guidance. Anyways, I spent. But, but take it back up a step. I mean, you're talking about, talk a little bit about your subject, your personal state of mind at the time. You said it was right after Gimel Thomas. So I was 15. No, but. Yeah. This was a few months it was, after it was Gimel a Tom- year it was a year after Gimel Thomas. A year after Gimel Thomas. What's what's it like at that time to be a Lubavitcher? If you remember. I, I, I wanna delve into this um this conversation. I don't know if like at this point in our in our podcast we or maybe we wait a little later and we come back to this question. Okay. It's sure. a really important question that I think many uh 
many people from my in my age are, are be just beginning to deal with, which is like the trauma of Gimel Thomas. Mm-hmm. Um, what does it mean to lose our Rebbe where like everything was, you know, I think for adults, um, you know, the Rebbe was unbelievable in like, I'm not going to do everything for you. Right. He was the Rebbe was unique in that way where like, I know, like this is on you. You need to do work. And little kids were just like, you know, what do little kids sort of know about that? We were in this like sweet spot where it's like 13 to 19. Um, our brains are not developed yet. We're and we lost kind of everything like like the magic just got pulled away. And now what? Um and I, the reason I ask is because you were just talking about playing basketball. Mm-hmm. You're a regular teenager. Mm-hmm. So a, a lot of people like to idealize, like, you know, back in the day, everyone, all they did when their was alive, all they did was learn to the whole day. And there's a bunch of, like, holy saints. No. You know, right? I, I, so I'll that's why you. I'm asking, like, you're, you're a regular American teenager who just goes through Gimel Thomas and ends up in Manchester. I mean, that's like... That's like one of the most dystopian stories I've ever heard in my life. So, so I'm trying to figure out, like, I want to jump. Yeah, I want to just yeah. mention something because you said that, like, you know, everybody thinks that back then everybody was learning so this. You know, it's sort of like Roman Vizniak's photos of pre-war Europe. Everybody thinks it was a bunch of poor chassidim. That's not true. Well, not, some of them were. Some of them weren't. Right. It's, so I think it's similar. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, there's there's also you you said that you said that like you had. I forgot the words you used a few minutes ago, but like to me, I'm thinking about like when you're 15 years old, you're talking about being in the sweet spot between 13 and 19. You know, so when you're a child, you're not thinking about the future. You just you're, you know, the the essence of childhood is that you're frolicking in the present. And you just you know you 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 know if you're either super happy about what you're doing or you're super mad, like the the world is very is shrunk down to mm-hmm. your present moment. You know, as you get older and you start hitting your teens, then you start having ideas of the future. But of course, your ideas of the future at that point are extremely idealized and naive mm-hmm. and very innocent. And like to me, I, I was I was much younger than you, so I was I was still living in the present. Like uh, they, when my father, I was in Hong Kong when the times happened, and when my my parents told us, we hardly knew what it meant because that was very abstract to us because we lived. 20 hour her mm-hmm. travel away and like you know and my father was sitting shiva and i was jumping on the couches like so that's where i was mm-hmm. you're you were older and so to me it feels like almost like your future is like completely the the, the rug is pulled mm-hmm. completely underneath from your future like okay wait, wait are we still gonna be Lubavitch in two years like are, like are we still doing this? Like you know, like what 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 what's what's the game plan? You know, like was were, were that things that you were thinking about, so, or were you too young to be thinking? So about I, that? I was a very very naive and immature, fifteen year old. <laughs> I, I really I really was. Um, I own that. A um, couple things. One is, um, I did not fly from L.A. to Crown Heights for Gimel Thomas. Mm-hmm. I couldn't get a hold of my father. I, I I didn't recognize like the level of magnitude here is like you're you know uh Mati Bagun is swiping credit his credit card for boys to book tickets. Like I should have just been like, I'm going and like that's it. And let let my father deal with paying this guy back later. But no, I I, I knew the money was money and I wasn't gonna spend three hundred dollars without speaking to him. So I didn't go and I always I've always felt I think for a long time I felt guilty about that. Um and I spent the next two days at my uncle's I have a, my dad's brother lived in, lived in Santa Monica. Uh, it was not religious at the time. And I spent the next two days watching news, the news cycle go from the grand, you know, the, the funeral of the grand Rebbe to OJ Simpson driving the Ford Bronco. I oh, mean, was it, the same time? it was the exact same time. It was wild. Wow. It was wild. I mean, like you talk about like cultures cla- converging, uh-huh. um, so, was it was it also strange to see the news talk about Chabad? Like, it wasn't like I mean, from what I gather, it wasn't like Lubavitch was making headlines on a regular basis. It wasn't weird to me. Mm-hmm. 
I was just trying to process. Now, the Rosh Hashiva, I think, did a very good job of just like calming, bringing the temperature down. Mm-hmm. Um, I remember at one point, uh, this uh, Rabbi Shochet? Rabbi Shochet, a, a Lubavitch family came in and they started arguing that Rebbe's Mashiach and he's gonna, and Rabbi Shochet stood there and calmly just. I think he did it for us, not for them, where, where it was like, no, 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 like this thing is going to continue and what will be will be and let's not, let's not lose. I, for some, in a very weird way, he was a very calming, strong, rock-like presence uh, for me as a very, very young Hasid. Um, I felt like I was in good hands. I felt like he had a real grasp of what was going on and he was going to, over the next year, he was going to um, and it was a weird year. It was an odd year. It was, it was I, I, yeah. Anyways, back to Manchester. So I ended up, yeah, so it's like dystopian, it's weird, it's dreary, it's bad, it's, it, there was a hole in the ceiling, I felt like I was fall three floors down. <laughs> like it was just, uh, the shower was just like beyond anything I'd ever seen. I went a whole week without showering. It was a nightmare, but in, in short. You know, can you imagine, like I, I haven't, I've never really told this story. I went a whole week without showering because I couldn't bring myself to use the shower. Mm-hmm. So Friday, and I feel, I remember feeling my hair was like just, gre- it was gross. Yeah. Maybe that's why no one wanted to be my friend. I probably smelled. And I asked them, I said, where do I take a... They said, oh, there's this bub of mikvah. It's like unbelievable. I remember standing and went to the bub of mikvah and stood there for like 45 minutes showering. Just getting it all off you. So I spent 10 days there um, and left. I was only <laughs> supposed to be there for 10 days. and You're only supposed to be there for I was 10 trying days? it out. Oh, you're trying it out. Okay. For the fall... For, for, for the owl. So well, it's a pretty big drama set up for, for just 10 days. <laughs> and my father, I remember my father telling me, he said, you did not impress them. And I remember thinking, yeah, I know I didn't. I hated it. No one paid attention to me. No one, the only guy that showed me anything was Rabbi Klein. He says, but they're willing to give you another shot and come for Ella. And I was like, no, I don't want to go back there. So he goes, okay, well, I don't know what we're going to do. I said, okay. I was sort of like, all right, well, I don't know either. I'm 16. I, I don't know. So this kolel that I told you about, the Rosh kolel stayed in Denmark. Um, what was the scandal? The scandal was is that he divorced his wife, who's a real Litvish guy, and married this Gyaris that he was Maguire. Crazy story. Um, he has since passed. I owe him a great debt of gratitude because he learned with me three days a week for the next couple months. I would ride my bike from my parents' house. I love Denmark. I love Copenhagen. I think it's one of the most amazing cities in the world um, that I've ever been to. Uh, And I would ride my bike, you know, seven, eight miles from my parents' house to his house, and we'd learn Gemara. And at the time in Denmark, there was a rabbi, there was a rav of the kihila, of the the Machzike Adas kihila, named uh, Rabbi Moshe Yaakovson. And Rabbi Moshe Yaakovson um, had a father, Benjamin Zave Yaakovson, who was a survivor of World War II, um, and, and, and saved many, many Jewish women and girls, and brought them through Sweden uh, to Israel, and set up a town called Be'er Yaakov, and set up a home for these girls, and, and, and really saved their lives. And Rabbi Moshe Yaakovson met the Rebbe once, and the Rebbe, without saying anything, the Rebbe said to him, you have no idea how great your father, what your father accomplished. So Ramesha is this, this six foot two, 240 pound, big beard, frock, Hamburg presence, right? Like you think about a Litvish Gavel, like that's, this is what they should look like. Just had presence, any room he walked in, he owned the room. And what was unique about him was, is that he would talk to a three-year-old on the three-year-old's level, and he could talk to you know, the Rosh Hashiva from Ponovich on their level and the chief rabbi. And the, I mean, he was just, he had such gravitas. And my parents became really close to him and his wife. His wife survived the cattle car for 11 days. She was left to die. Uh, just an, an extraordinary couple. And I loved seeing him. I loved interacting with him. And he offered my father, he said, I'll take him, I'll, I'll take care of this. Are you, if you're willing, I'll take care of this, but it's not going to be Lubavitch Yeshiva because I don't have 
my father says, do you, do you, do you, I trust you. And we got on an airplane, Ramesh and I, and we flew to London and we spent Shabbos in Manchester at the Litzvah Yeshiva. And I said, Ramesh, as much as I like this Yeshiva, I can't, I can't physically bring myself to spend. Gates said you're talking about? No, Manchester. Mm-hmm. I can't spend any time in Manchester. I just, I'm too triggered by it. And I remember him saying, all right, upwards we go. And we got in a car Sunday morning. We drove to Gateshead. Mm -hmm. And we get into Gateshead town, village, whatever you want to call it. And there was a bacher walking. And he says to the driver, pull up next to that that boy over there. So he does. And he rolls down the window, Ramesha. And he says, you know, young man, come here. So the boy walks over to us. And, you know, he sees this, he sees this very distinguished looking rabbi with a long white beard and a, and a Hamburg, you know, he, he says, where, where does the Rosh Hashiva live? So he says, well, there's two. There's Rav Ram Gorowitz, who is the, the, you know, the Rosh Hashiva of Yeshiva Gedele. And he says, there's Rav Israel Yafe, who's the Rosh Hashiva of the Yeshiva Tana. So he says, well, I have a boy here who's 16. So he says, oh, you want the Yeshiva Tana because the Yeshiva Tana goes from 16 to 19. Um, and the Yeshiva Gedele starts at 18 and goes till. He says, well, where does he live? And he says, down the block, right over there, number 12. So we pull up. And as we're getting out of the car, I finally look at him and I said, Ramesha, how, how is this going to work? And he said, I used to babysit this, this Rosh Hashiva. Echkenem from the, from, from the diapers. I said, Okay. Like, I don't even know how it was dressed. To be honest, I was probably wearing sneakers and a and Ramesha again gets to see the physic, knocks on the door, and the Rosh Hashiva opens the door. And the Rosh Hashiva like sees this image of like this this Rav and this boy and kind of has like this moment. And Ramesha says, I have a boy for your Yeshiva. This is second week into Zman after Tishrei. And the Rosh Hashiva just starts, doesn't, he says, will you, will you invite us in? I remember that. So we go into the house and he, exp- he says the following thing. I have a boy for your Yeshiva. He's an American Chabadnik whose father can pay full tuition. <laughs> the rest of the conversation I have no memory of. I was going to let the adults do their thing. I'm just kind of looking around. He says, well, I can't, has he seen the yeshiva? He can't, I'm not going to accept him. There was a waiting list of 300 boys to get in. Ramesha just leapfrogged me, who are far more, uh, uh, had far better credentials. Mm-hmm. I couldn't read Hebrew, practically. I mean, like, let's be honest. Like, So... I go see the yeshiva. An hour later, he calls me into his office. Ramesh is standing there. And he says, Ramesh says to me, you've been accepted. He's like, what do you say? I was like, thank you? Like, I didn't realize what kind of a, what had just transpired. And Ramesh goes, okay, I'll send regards to your parents. I said, uh, I'm not going back with you. He goes, no. I said, but I didn't bring anything. He says, we'll ship it to you. Don't worry. I said, okay. He leaves. I'm a Chabad yeshiva boy one year after Gimel Tamos, uh, just accepted into a hotbed <laughs> of anti Chabad Litvisha, European Litvisha Hasnagdos. And this is all going on during the OJ Simpson trial. OJ Simpson meant nothing to me. <laughs> just, just to be clear, the Rosh Hashiva Panovich is still alive. Right. The literature world is celebrating right. the demise of Lubavitch. Right. And here I am, just plopped into this yeshiva. Now, the, f- <laughs> the funniest thing was, is that I wore at the time, I had a blue velvet yarmulke with, you know, the stitching? When you had stitching in a yarmulke, it just had blue waves. Yeah, I remember so that. So blue on blue. Sure, I remember You that. couldn't even see. It was just a blue yarmulke. Right. But in the literature world, the boys who wear black yarmulkes exclusively. Rumor went around that day that the Zalabavitcher was just accepted to, to Gateshead, to the yeshiva, and he's wearing a yechi yarmulke. 
I think I wore a yarmulke for like a year. Like, you know, in like Tough Shunun Bay's type of deal. Oh, really? People did that back in the day? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. I didn't know that. I yeah. thought it started later on. Yeah. So, I stayed at the Rosh Hashiva's house for three nights because they, they didn't have... And then finally they put me in a, in a house. Now, you know, when you're a Lubavitcher, there's, there's two levels of Jews, right? There's the Rebbe, and then there's everybody else, right? It doesn't. I don't care if you're the Rosh Hashiva, you're the Mashpia, you're, you're, you're the chief rabbi. You're not the Rebbe. Or the janitor. Or the janitor. It's just everybody. <laughs> but you're, if you're not the Rebbe, you're not the Rebbe, and that's it. There's, in that world, that's not how that works. No. And so, but I didn't know that. So I'm busy having breakfast with the Rosh Hashiva and just chatting and talking and not knowing that I should be far more be'ema ubiyira than I was. Were you saying would you like and not what the Rosh Oh no 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 I didn't know how you I didn't know how you that you person. talk in third person. I didn't know this yet. Um but it served me quite well over the next three years. You were there for three I years. I spent three years there. Huh. And I did because I was gonna prove something to them and to myself. Wow. So you 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 uh, you acclimate to it, you situate yourself there. And at no point do you say, okay, I'm ready to go try another, go back to my comfort zone, some other Chabad Yeshiva. No, I was going to finish three years. I was gonna, I'm going to finish it. I'm going to finish. I, I, I really, I would do it again in a heartbeat. Wow. Um, so that's really, that's really, a, that's really an interesting story. So that you, post Gimel Tamos, you, you like, because you're saying that everybody your age is beginning to return back to that and like revisit what happened. But in your case, you didn't really. You, one thing that you didn't have was like three years of collective grief surrounding you, because, like you said, if anything, people were kind of happy that about what had happened. So I evolved. So, I, I, it's pro, it's pro, in a way that was probably helpful. It was probably it was very helpful. Um, the first six months were were, were exceedingly difficult, mm -hmm. from many levels, from a learning standpoint. Um, uh, from a being, you know, in the new environment, culture shock. Um, most of the boys were really understanding um, and kind and generous. There were a few bad apples. Right. Not many. Um, two stories in particular. One is uh, a Sher Gimmelbacher, so a guy three years older than me. Uh, was cheppering me and cheppering me and cheppering me, and uh, eventually said, "I'm I'm so glad that the Reb is dead," and I socked him in the face. It was just a visceral reaction, and he then pummeled me. And I went running to the Rosh Hashiva's house. Basically, I was going to say, "I said I'm done," and thank God he wasn't home. And I walked back to my dorm, and I just I was like, "But that boy never said another word to me." Because he may have gotten the best of me in the fight, but he he felt it for three days after. Another similar incident around the same. And that's when you started weightlifting. No, 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 no. That we'll get to that. That's it. But another boy, another boy said something very similar to me, as a shear was about to begin. Um, actually, the Magid shear uh, is Ramatisio Solomon, who's who's the Mashkiach in, in Lakewood. Who needs a refuah shleima. His son. And the shear's about to begin, and this boy is cheppering and chirping. His son was one starting. No, 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 his son was the Magad Shear. Right, right. Was the teacher. And he walks in, and I just, like, the floodgates start open. I was just crying. I wasn't wailing. I was just, tears were streaming down because it was so painful. And he looked at me, and I've never really shared the story with anybody. And he kind of goes like, goes like this with his hands, like, lifts him up, like, what, like what's wrong? And I'm just, I'm just, tears are flowing down my face. And a bucker said something along the lines of, you know, he's cheppering the Rebbe or something along those lines. And he just gave a look. And really after that, I don't think there was anything. There were a few other instances. I, had a, I, had a, I actually had a Chavrusa who used to write letters to Chaim Kanievsky. Um, I don't know if he was considered back then the Saratayr or not, but he would write Reb Chaim. I, he wore chavrusas. I would see him write the questions, and Reb Chaim would answer him. Really? 
yeah, 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 yeah. It was like kind of a big deal. Like every month or two, he'd get a letter back from Rukhayim. Rukhayim would answer on the, and we, he would open it up and he, it was like a big deal. But he, he asked, a, he, a, I shared this recently with somebody and I think it, it's, oh, I shared it after Rukhayim passed away with a, with a group of friends of mine that are not Lubavitchers. He wrote a letter. One of his questions was, can I join a Chabad minion or use a Chabad mikvah? And I remember telling him, like, why are you bothering Reb Chaim with such questions? Right. And he says, oh, I need to know. Uh. And I'm like, you're an idiot. <laughs> you know, you're just like, why are you wasting this? this? Reb Chaim responded. He asked about 10, 12 questions in this thing. Reb Chaim answered like nine of the questions. Just left those two questions blank. And what I took from it, and I remember saying to this to him at the time, I was like, "See, even Reb Chaim thinks your questions are stupid." <laughs> when you talk about like, you know, fourteen, fifteen years old, taking these kind of things personally, um, was it because like you really felt offended on behalf of the Rebbe? Like, the Rebbe was that important to you, or was it that like you feel like? I have no clue. Like I, I'm, I don't know what Chabad's like. What Chabad's doing right? What what, what my Chabad or Lubavitch world, however you were referring to it. Like I don't know what these shivas, what these shivas look like right now. I'm not really part of that world. I don't know what I'm going back to down the road. Like I'm basically, it's almost like a, a child who's orphaned, right? Like if 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 somebody makes fun of their father, is it is it because and they get upset? Is it because their father's memory is so dear to them, or is it because they're so lost in this world and it's like you're pouring salt onto injury? I mean, it could be that's nitpicking, but I, I mean, I guess I guess my my question is like, do you, looking back, because this like, this concept of like a lost future is something that's very interesting to me because it, it, I think I think it's something that plagues us to this day. It is. It. it I, I think it was a lost future. Mm -hmm. It not so much a lost future, but a loss in potential. Mm -hmm. Um. And, and so this person picking on you is basically just pouring salt into injury. It's like you, Lubavitcher, look at you. You thought you were you thought you were the game a few months ago or a few years ago, and look at you now. You know, we can make fun of you. And you know, I think I was genuinely uh, offended on behalf of the Rebbe. Okay. Um. I may not have fully understood what the Rebbe meant to me, but I knew that the Rebbe meant a tremendous amount to me. Okay. Um, that I was only a fr a, an observant Jew because of the Rebbe. My parents became from because of the Rebbe. Mm -hmm. You know, my mother, my mother has a story too. It's not quite as exciting as my, you know, there's no, there's no sukkahs falling down in my mother's story, right? Um, but my mother, my mother, Grew up in a conservative Jewish home in Toronto and, and did a Shabbaton to Crown Heights and uh, fell in love with it. I mean, I, I recently started asking more questions of my mother, and apparently there's more to the story than my mother ever told us. But she wanted to go back, and my my grandparents wanted her to go back and, and become a lawyer. And the Rebbe, the Rebbe was actually very involved in decision-making with my mother, uh, which I never knew. Um, mm -hmm. I encouraged her to you know strategize with my mother a little bit. On, on how to deal with my with my grandparents, um, but you know, this whole who's the bigger chassid, my mother, my father, that whole thing. Um, now, not only is there we're moving to Denmark, but there's my son, my bechar, my only son, at the time. I have a little brother who was born years later, so it was six girls, and then my little brother is now in a hasa litvish yeshiva. <laughs> But my mother always said that she, she got a bracha from the, she got a dollar from the Rebbe, and she asked the Rebbe about chinuch for her son, and she always felt that like everything that happened to me in chinuch was, was the Rebbe's yad. So to her, me being in Gateshead was was not something to be lamented, but she was actually like, if he's doing what he's supposed to be doing, then then this is all part of the plan. Yeah, look, my father also went to a uh, litvish yeshiva in, at that age. Um, I, you know, there's, there's different reasons of why, from what I can tell. But you know, he he went, to, so it's not something completely foreign to me. Although I I never heard a story of that happening to somebody 
at that point in yeah. time. I think it was a little bit more common earlier on. Oh, the world tried to get me out. Who's the world? The, the shluchim and friends and classmates. People tried to... They, oh! We got to save him. We got to save him. And you were... I'm not interested. Like, I'm... I, by about six months in, I was like, no, no, no. No, I'm here. And, and so you said it was there, you, were, you were trying to prove them that you could make it there? You're trying to prove the gates and people that I could make it on your turf? I... I or I, or I, was I, there a little bit of... Like, I just got burnt really hard in the Manchester Chabad Yeshiva. Like, you know, maybe I'm not interested right now. And so I don't feel like I was burnt by Manchester. I felt, uh, I've never felt any ill. Well, not that they intentionally hurt you, but like you went to this Yeshiva and it was uh, a disaster for you. One of, one, of, one of the bad things that came out of LA for me was, is that I felt that, that LA made me feel like I was going to amount to nothing. Interesting. That I was, I had nothing going for me. So this almost gave you a opportunity to kind of carve your own path. If I go with everybody else, everybody else that I know, at the rate that I'm going, I'm going to be a nobody. Whereas here, I have an opportunity to be different. I would frame it more in my observance. I had a lot of friends from LA from those years that, that did not remain observant. Because of the rabbit passing away? Or I think it was probably a combination of that and the, the, the certain Anahala members in LA and, and what was Los going Angeles. on and, just being, and being in Los Angeles. And I was going to prove them wrong. Mm -hmm. So what you're saying is that you, you were on the path of kind of f falling off the path. Well, I wasn't on a path. Right. I didn't feel like I was on a path when I went to LA. I was just, I was just a 14-year-old kid who, who uh, knew he was good at sports. Mm -hmm. And knew that, like, this is kind of like the way that you do it. And my parents kind of made decisions for me. And I was like, all right, here I am. Yeah, it's almost like a story. Like, there are all kinds of these archetypical stories where, like, you know, a person, you know, a person um, fails in a society, you know, gets shipwrecked somewhere else or gets imprisoned or whatever and builds, you know, somehow escapes a different world, an alternate reality builds himself up and then returns victorious. Yeah, yeah. That's kind of what it yeah, sounds like. It is. It is. Because because I physically, I was very little. I was very short. Mm -hmm. um, you know, growing up in Seattle, just to go back to Seattle for a minute, um, my two friends, Mendy Kornfeld and Senator Kafka, they, they physically grew much earlier than me. I have a picture somewhere that I can show you of, of us at, I think, Mendy's Bar Mitzvah. And Mendy and Sender are both a head taller than me. And I, there I am, this little shrimp. And so we had this boy who, who became a part of our, our, of our group, this kid named Shaul Galler. And so it was the four of us in class. And every recess we'd play basketball, it was always two on two. It was usually Mendy and Shoal against me and Sender. And, you know, we played, I mean, we played 80s style basketball. So there was elbows and pushing and fouls and beating up. And there was always, always ended up in a fight. And uh, the fight always was Mendy chasing after my Shalab and Sender sticking up for my Shalab. And because I was the smaller one. And, um, and Shoal and I really didn't get along. I think we, we were constantly at each other's kind of throats, um, as, you know, 12, 13 year old boys are. Um, and so when I came back from Gateshead, so what's interesting is that the timeline was so, right? So I went to Gateshead 16 to 17, 17, 18. I was done Gateshead at 19. And my family was only in Denmark for three years. So they moved back to Seattle. And I remember coming back for Pesach, my third year in Gateshead for Yontif. And I remember how excited I was. I was really, really like, because we had a Kinnus Tyra every year on Shvi Shal Pesach. And I had written like this you know, I've been learning for, for two and a half years, like 12 hours a day in, in Zal learning Gemara. And I had written this pilpul and I was like, you know, I was so excited that I was finally, I remember, you know, growing up watching Shmuley Kornfeld and Ellie Kornfeld and Alter Levitin, these guys giving. And I was like, I'm, this is like kind of this prodigal son returns right. in my own brain. But what I didn't realize is that I left Seattle four foot 10 and I'm coming back to Seattle five foot 10. But Senator Mendy didn't grow anymore. No, you're taller. So now I'm taller than them. <laughs> but but here's the here's the saddest part. At 18, you don't care anymore. Who cares, right? <laughs> it's very much a who cares. Yeah. But I remember being like, oh my God, I'm so much bigger. That's funny. 
Um, and and that I wasn't even working out then, so I was just, I was just taller, right. right? I was a stick. I weighed I weighed 130 pounds, maybe. Is there is there ever something in you today that like you think? Wait a second! Like a lot of my ability to learn, a lot of my knowledge comes from the very people who, you know, typically we would think are like you know we're not supposed to we're not supposed to be getting it from them. Yeah. Right. They're, I mean, things have kind of mellowed. The animosity isn't at the pitch that you were mm-hmm. describing mm-hmm. earlier, but you know, like. And nobody wants to be like the the recipient, you know, the recipient, yeah. or you don't want to be like the misnagged in the room, you know. Oh, I'm the misnagged in the room. Right. I mean, so, my friends make fun of. I'm the I'm the. To this day, I'm talking about. What's that? To this day. To the day. To, to the, the day. day. That there's an ongoing joke. Does it ever? Does it ever? Does it ever bother you? No. That doesn't bother you. No, I've embraced it. You've embraced it. So um, you're you're so you're like you you. At, as a teenager, probably a little bit frustrated and angry and looking with a chip on your shoulder, you want to prove a point. You kind of go on this vendetta that I'll show them. And you kind of stuck with it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it, 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 certainly, there's, there's, there, that's there somewhere. Yeah. Um, I'm saying, like, it hasn't changed. Like, there was a mashkiach. You don't regret it. I don't regret it. Not, okay. not even, not even a drop. That's, there that's was a mashkiach um, in Gateshead at the time. Uh, named Rabbi Hudaleb Whitler. Okay. He had a, shy, a really strong shaykh as the Lubavitch. And so, Yotes Kislev and, you know, Yud Shvat, Yom the Paga, we would actually frabrang. He would invite me to his house, and we would sit in frabrang. He was a, he was a, he could have been coming to Lubavitch. There was, there was, a, there was a pivotal, mo- anyways. And I, I asked him something along the lines of like, you know, was it a good thing that I was here or something like this? And, and he said, you know, Dan Hala discussed you. Not whether we should accept you, because it was Ribizriel already accepted you. But what are we going to do with this kid? And is this good? And, and should we really try to get him to leave? And I actually asked the Rosh Hashiva uh, right when I left, or as I was leaving, I said, Why did you accept me three years ago? And he said, I thought you would leave within two weeks. <laughs> and and I'd still get the full tuition. No. But but <laughs> you, you made a point I, I, I had to I had to, I couldn't say no to Ramesha, but I thought you would leave. So he says, you know, we discussed you. And um, there were those who said, this is terrible. This is not good. Right. This is gonna co- he's going to cause a lot of problems. Not, not because he's a problem kid, but because he's a little monitor. sheep, yeah. And, and I made the argument that I, th- I said, you know, there's going to be five, six years of Yeshiva Bachram coming in who are going to learn to respect another Yid. Hmm. And he says, that's what you accomplished here. He says, every single boy that I talk to about you respects you. Respects you as a Lubavitcher, respects you as a peer, respects you as a as a as a B'nai Taira. And that I knew at that moment, it solidified that this was the right thing. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the Rosh Shiva gave a shear once, and he talked about the, the, the Manera, and he made a joke, an offhanded joke about you know the, those who put Maneras on their cars, thinking that that's that that's a Kiyom mitzvah. And I raised my hand, and he looked at me, and I said, with all due respect, Rebbe Israel, it's not why they put the Meneir on the car. It's Pirsumi Nisa. It's, 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 it's we, we all light our own Meneirs at home. And he, and he apologized. He said, oh. You know. But he would learn with me. As, a, as, a, as my last year, he had a regular Bachar Chavrus that he would learn with at night. And when that Bachar wasn't there, I was the replacement guy. We would have conversations and he would, he learned Gemara because that's what he learned in Lithuanian Yeshivas. But with me, he would learn like Ramban Alatayra. At any point were you like, okay, so I've, I've, I grew up in a Chabad family. I keep on going between Chabad and Lubavitch. How did you consider yourself? Chabad, Lubavitch? Yes, both. Yeah, both. We kind of use them interchangeably. But you grow up in this Chabad Lubavitch family, uh, but your parents themselves are Bali Tshuva, so like you know that this wasn't like a given, even two generations earlier. Mm-hmm. You're 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 in this family that almost happens to be Chabad, right? And then you go to Yeshiva that's very not Chabad. At some point, do you go like you know what? Maybe I'll be my own guy, like. Were, 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 you, were you always sure that you were going to come back before even deciding to go on Shluchas? Were, like, were you always sure that you were going to come back? Not that, not that I think you were going to run away from all your friends, but at any point you're like, you know, I'm going to be my own thing. I'm going to be this combination. I'm going to be, 
you know, because I'm sure there's also things that you picked up there where you're like, okay, wait a second, what we do at Chabad's a little bit crazy, or like there's some things that we do here that seem to be better than what we do over there. And so I, I learned this about myself years later. Um, I am a loyalist. Mm, okay. Um, in everything. I'm, I'm a real loyalist. Uh, so I don't think I would have left Chabad only under the most extreme circumstance. But not leave it completely. More uh, like... I, to me, I wasn't going to mish. I, I knew people who mished. They were weird to me. Uh huh. You know, Lubavitchers, but had pay us behind their ears. That was always like a weird thing to me. Mm-hmm. Um, you're a Lubav- You wear a down hat, but you're married and you wear a suit, but with a guard. That's weird to me. I, I didn't want to stand out that day. I didn't because you look at as a kid. You when I was growing up, you looked at that person like, oh, they're not really. Uh, you know, so no. Now, had I stayed in the Litvish world another few years? Who knows? I could have. I also don't think that the European style uh, uh, was attractive to me. It was very fetched. It was very... Um, yeah, well, Gates had known to be that way. Now, I, I was going to say, had I gone to Lakewood, but even Lakewood back then was like this. Yeah, yeah. The Lakewood of today was not Lakewood of, no. of then. Um so that's one of the reasons that that the animosity is down. A lot of it is cultural. A lot right. of it is cultural, and and you know, people, there's a lot more overlap. <laughs> the the brute truth of it is that we're all more Americanized. That's that's what's yes. really going on. But um, yes, I mean, look at what's going on with with the rise of, you know, not to go off topic, but and I love it. I think it's great. But the the rise of like the Balabas Magadshir. Right, like the Ellie Stefanski and right. the Srilly Bornstein. These are guys that they don't owe allegiances to anybody. Right. They're not a co- they're not company men. Right. They're multi-millionaire businessmen. I mean, Srilly in particular, who's just an unbelievable balkishan, who can learn, who has a Vilda cup, who gives a phenomenal share and has thirty thousand people listening to his Dafiemi share every day. Right. They're not beholden to anybody. Right. They're not towing a line. Right. They're towing Gemara Rashi Taisis. That's it. Right. I love it, but I think that it wouldn't have been possible 30 years ago, but it's possible today. Yeah, that's the, that's the New Hampshire coming out and you, the libertarian. Yeah. <laughs> There's something very libertarian about from Judaism today, which one could be quite optimistic about, where, you know, the idea, because people are making their own money and, like, and therefore are less beholden to the institutions, mm-hmm. maybe in the way that they used to be, um, the upside is that you know the individual can can really cast aside the the kind of the, the 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 silly history and the pettiness that accumulates over time and just you know like I don't have to not bring up this Pirish in the Gemara because f- four generations ago there was a fight you know and something like that so there's something very libertarian about that but the the downside which is I think we're, we're what we wanted to discuss. Um, going into this, which is identity begins to fracture. Mm-hmm. Yeah, identity begins to fracture, and that's that's why I'm pushing you a little bit about you know when you go to this Litvish Shiva, at some point does that begin to pressure your identity? So you said, no, I was always going to go back to being a Lubavitcher. That leads me to the question: What is a Lubavitcher? Mm. Right at the time, what did it mean to you to be a Lubavitcher? Did it just mean using the examples you used earlier that, you know, you weren't going to wear pace behind your ears. You're going to have pace in front of your ears. Was that like, are you talking just like the, 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 the look of the Lubavitcher? Cause what's fascinating to me about your story is you leave Lubavitch basically at a moment of crisis. Not that it's not that I'm implying that you left it because of the crisis. It's the contrary. Like it just, it so happened in your life, but you leave it at a moment of severe crisis, severe identity crisis, no question. And you come back a few years later and, you've kind of stabilized who you are, right? And Chabad has also stabilized what it is. When you come back, is it what you thought it would be? Yeah. Um, no, it wasn't. <laughs> no, it wasn't. Right. In what way? I, um, I don't know if I should say the story. Why not? I guess I will. <laughs> Again, it's an analogy. I mean, it's 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 not analogy. It's um, 
It's just, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? It's anecdotal. Mm -hmm. There's a, uh, there's an action that young boys engage with, which is an unhealthy action, but it's human nature and we all do it. Alter Abba writes about it in Tanya profusely. And, um, you're referring to masturbation. I'm referring to masturbation. Okay. And so I'm in Gateshead, right? And, um, I finish up. I was actually going to go to another Litvish yeshiva after that. I was going to go to the Litvish yeshiva that was in Stanford, Connecticut at the time, which is, was considered a very good yeshiva because my parents had moved back to America and they were now living in, they were going to be moving to Boston. And, and of course, things happen. Um, I went for my Faher, even though I got glowing recommendations, I got sick the night before, like really, really, really sick. And so I went to this Fahar like I was ice mensch. I was not myself, and I bombed the Fahar. And they rejected me. I couldn't believe it. And through Yitzi Lowenthal, my father, and a few others, uh, and Levi Deitch, Allah Shalom, I was ex- my, the only Chabad Yeshiva my father felt that I belonged in was Migdal Amik. Hmm. It had that reputation, Itchka Goldberg, high level learning. Okay. I ended up getting in. And. I remember very seriously thinking about this, being like, in Lubavitch, the Bachram don't masturbate. They're chassidish of Bachram. They learn chassidish. It's pile on them, but pile. And they don't do it. And so therefore, I need to stop. And I did. And then, (laughs) I was gobsmacked when I found out that it's just as prevalent there as it was in Gateshead. Wait a second. Was that because things had changed or because you had grown up and found out? What no, was I grew up and found out that, that, okay. that, in other words, I thought there was an ideal that people were actually living out. Mm-hmm. And then there was this moment where it's like, they're not living it out. Mm-hmm. This fundamental action that we're like, as Bachar, like there's nothing bigger and they're all doing it. So in this weird way, you almost have this kind of Balchuva moment. Yes. You know what you're saying you have this Balchuva moment yes. where, like, you know, your, your father had it in his way, but you have it in your way. You grow up in this Chabad family, then you leave, even though you're always going to come back. When you come back, you realize, wait a second, it's not what I thought it was. I, I'll, let me put it another way. It began. You were talking about identities and fracturing. This began to fracture the idea of. Unser Zaburis is besser from Zaria this. Uh, interesting. And it's something that today I hate. Mm. I push back on it. I challenge people about it. I don't believe it's true. Mm-hmm. And I think it's 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 deeply unhealthy for us to be talking this way because I don't believe it's true. It can be true, but I don't believe as a rule it's true. It should be true, but it, but but in a way because we've taken it as this kind of normative line, as if like this describes reality de facto. In many ways, one could argue that it leads us to the to having a problem because when when you kind of it makes you very um, very what's a word very presumptuous and very like oh yeah I'm a, I'm, I'm a Lubavitcher I'm an Yeshiva like so all's good and it's like wait a second if you don't if you don't like if if you don't hold yourself to a higher standard then what are we even talking about here? When we take that as just like a statement of fact and a description of reality without, and not like a call to... Exactly. Like, like this is how you have to behave, that like this yeshiva demands at the lowest, like the lowest, the, the entry point of this yeshiva is the highest mm-hmm. point of some other yeshiva. Like mm-hmm. that's the ideal. But we just, bec- oh, no, of course, that's just how it is by virtue of you being here. Then it only makes sense that eventually behavior begins to slip because nobody feels like they, you know, that they have to aspire to anything. The way I, the way I think about this, and this is this is this is me thinking about this today as as a almost forty four year old, and so I certainly wasn't thinking about this at nineteen, but I think in a lot of ways I was thinking about it this way, which is the Rebbe, the Chabad is trying to create the healthiest humans. The, or I'll use it. I'll use a, a gym term: the fittest humans. And if we define fitness just for a minute, what does it mean to be fit? 
And it means being able to do, you, you're, you can run, you can jump, you, gymnastics, you can lift somewhat heavy. Um, you, you know, your metabolic conditioning is good. Your VO2 max is good, right? I think everybody would agree that that's the level of, that, that is the epitome of fitness, right? Mm -hmm. Now, is a, is a marathon runner fit? I would, I would argue no. They, they, they're a specialist. They can run for a long time. Uh, is a power lifter fit? Well, no, they're really strong, but like ask them to run a mile and they'll die. So I look at the Jewish world and I see Chabad as what the Rebbe wanted, what Chassidus wants is, is exceptional Jews. You know how to daven, you know how to learn, you know how to do Gemil Chassadim, you know how to do Mufsayim, you know how to do outreach, you know how to do inreach. You know, you know we There's want no compromises. We want you excellent everywhere. Mm -hmm. I look at other places within Yiddishkeit and they're specialists. Right. You know, you know the, the epitome for my peers in Gateshead was to be an outstanding learner. I wasn't taught how to dab in there. I mean, we had a we had a we had a halacha chavrusa for like fifteen minutes a week. You know, so but they could learn a daf gemara, right? So they're specialists, mm -hmm. um, and people like to be specialists. But at, the older we get, the re, we realize that, like, well, I, you know, at a certain point, you got to be well rounded, and so that's, you know, we talk about. I mean, this is sort of jump leapfrogging into sort of defining what Chabad is and defining what the Rebbe is and define, you know, in my own mind, that's. I think that was even starting then. I needed now sometimes to be the best CrossFitter. You know, are people that came from gymnastics backgrounds or people that came from weightlifting backgrounds? Well, okay, that's the foundation that you're building off of. So my foundation for my adult life as, a, as, as an observant Jew was Gateshead. Mm -hmm. It was this appreciation for learning, um, understanding that, that, you know, this is the idea of kihem chayenu verechimenu and that this is the wisdom of the Abishar. And, and it fit, it was congruent with Chabad. Right. Meaning you got exposure to the idea that this one thing that you're doing is worth dedicating your entire life, which is a lot more one of the reasons why some people or many people will choose to do running to the extreme or lifting to the extreme, because in many ways that that's easier to latch onto than to be good at everything, because mm -hmm. good at everything means you're not you don't have the time and the dedication to any one thing, which makes it harder to excel at any one thing. And also it's harder to, it's harder for your mind to focus on excelling at so many things. Your mind, uh, give me a task. A lot of people, especially like, give me one task and I'll do it right. Give me 10 tasks and all of a sudden I'm all over the place. And so you're saying that your to this day, your foundation is from a very specialist focused background, which, which is not something that's gone away. Um, how does that translate? How does it translate into your? How does it translate into your identity? Well, you're saying how it translates into your identity that it's still very much part of who you are. So let, let's move forward a little bit to, uh, you know, we took a, we took a pretty large detour, so I don't even know if we're going to be able to cover so much of the whole shlichus topic. Sure. But, uh, we can always do this another time. Sure. Part two, but you were talking about going on shlichus, which to bring the story full circle, your. Your mother had always wanted you to become a rabbi and probably a shliach. Your father, not so much. And you decide to be go to go on shlichus. Uh, at that point, at that point, why did you essentially you are doubling down in the biggest way on your chabad identity? Like there's nothing more chabad than going on shlichus. Like there's you can't half-ass it. Mm -hmm. You know, as they act like I'll be a little bit Chabad, a little bit Litvish. Right, little, right. Like, there's no Litvak in Dartmouth. <laughs> there's, there's no part. There's no part of any Litvak that exists in this town. This doesn't doesn't make any sense, right? So, what what makes you decide that this is that this is the, the way you want to live your life and the way you want to raise your kids? Yeah. So you know, we talked before this about you know. It was a very rational decision, right? It was never, I'm moving on shlichus l'man I'm moving on shlichus because that's what the Rebbe wants. That was not my thought process. It helps that that's there, but that was not, that wasn't enough. 
um, I had it, I, I, I was, so, you know, going back to my yeshiva years, I ended up, finished Gateshead, went to Migdal Amic for a year, went to yeshiva in Montreal for a year, and ended up as a shliach uh, in New Haven, Connecticut for a year. And as a bacher. As a bacher. And um, this is back in the day when Kalman Sins Yeshua was in yeah, the house. Yeah. It was, it was the best, it was the most fun year I've, I, I had as a, as, a, as a yeshiva boy. I loved it. It was like living in a frat with 19 of my best friends. And uh, that the, was a unique yeshiva where basically the shluchim were the yeshiva. That's right. right. That's right. That's right. We, we really had no other obligations other than to sit and learn all day. And a little bit of community yeah. involvement. Whatever you wanted. Yeah. Um, and it was put together by two of my friends from Oli Terra. Um, oh, you were the founding class of it? No, no, no. They, they put together that kfut, that year's kfutza. They somehow convinced, you know, Robert Prokarski to send them all to New Haven. And no one wanted to go to New Haven. New Haven's not exotic. It's the least exotic of spaces. Um, so my friends, you know, it was like eight of them. They somehow convinced Robert Prokarski to send all eight of these guys there. And uh, they called me up and they're like, you know, we'd love for you to come. And so I, I was able to get myself onto that kfutza. Um, and it's an extremely tight knit group. Uh, we're, we're talking 20, 23 years later. We have a WhatsApp group that was is, is vibrant. Uh, the first guy, literally, as we're podcasting, the first child of that kfutza just got engaged. Oh, that's nice. Which is really ironic. Um, many of us are in shlichas. Uh, some of us are not. Um, we try to get together at least once a year in Fabrang. Usually over the Kinnis Um It's really a special group. I mean, you don't hear many groups like this. Um, you hear groups of friends, but never sort of 20 guys. Um, so I get on this, right? And, and, and part of me, part of me was, I want to check out Yale University. Like, you know, all of a sudden this childhood of hearing my father's story is, it's starting to awaken. And, and uh, at the time, um, I mean, they still live there. Shmuley and Toby Hecht. Uh, it was running an organization called the Chai Society at the time. Toby and I grew up together in Seattle. Her father was was the head shliach there. Um, and I was like, you know, this could be an interesting opportunity. Like, let me see if you know this is exciting or interesting. And so I owe them, you know, a tremendous debt of gratitude. Um, so I get there, and the first week I call her up and I say, Toby, you know, I'm here, and she's like, great, you know, love to have you when you come Friday night to the Chai Society. And I walked in, and I mean, it was like love at first sight. Like I fell in love with the vibe immediately. Here's, in my mind, it was like hundreds of students, but it wasn't. It was probably 40, 50 students, maybe, sitting around this kind of long table that L'd out into fort, because it was like a brownstone, so it wasn't, right. didn't have one big room. And I remember that Friday night, uh, I didn't eat anything. I just was saying l'chaim and arguing. I was like, for the first time in my life, I was being challenged by like really smart, articulate, secular Jews about everything that I believed in. Mm -hmm. They're asking me about everything, what my thoughts are on, on U.S. politics. I mean, remember, that was the year of, of the hanging Chad. That was 2000, right? So the, the Bush, mm -hmm. the Bush Gore election and, you know, Israel politics and Zionism and homosexuality and, and all these desperate different things. And I'm, I'm all of a sudden, I'm finding myself having to like grapple myself. Like, what do I believe? Mm -hmm. not just parrot or mimic some of these things I didn't even know like mm -hmm. I don't know so I started learning and researching and growing and having conversations and, and uh, weekly chavrusas with these guys that weren't half an hour chavrusas they weren't hour chavrusas they were, these would take hours because we would sit and talk and talk and talk and to the day I'm like friends with probably seven or eight of them hmm. um, and they're amazing um, we go to each other's simchas and so I finish that year and I'm like, if I can do this full time, I'm going to do it. This is like, this has given me more meaning than anything I've ever done in my life. But you initially went to see it to think of going there yourself, right? Not to be the shleich at Yale. No. To, to go to university yourself at some point? I was like, I thought maybe it could be an interesting thing that I was going to, at that point I was like, I was going to go make money. Yeah. I wasn't going to be a shleich, but the idea of being a rabbi on a campus had, it was interesting to me. Mm -hmm. um, I had no idea I would fall in love with it as quickly as I did. So I called my parents. I said, I think this is it. 
And my parents were like, whoa, whoa, pump, pump the brakes. <laughs> you know. And, and if you know Shmuley Hecht at all, yeah, I, I mean, he's like just a ball of energy. Yeah. And he was hyping me up and I was hyping him up. And he's like, this is the greatest thing ever. And look who we're influencing. And this is the future leaders of the world. And look at these kids that you're being exposed to. And I was like, I know, I know. Like, let, let's go. Like, I love this. And at the time, Chabad on Campus was a much smaller oh, yeah. phenomenon. Oh, yeah. I mean, it was, it was the proof of concept for this, for the revitalization of Chabad on Campus was was Shmuley and Hershey's Archie at Harvard. I mean, these were at these two schools, which Ivy League schools. no one wanted to touch 30 years before. And here they are, they're showing this proof of concept. They're showing how they can raise money and live and influence the best and the brightest. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I, I was like, I was just taken by this. I was enamored. And I was like, why do something out of Kabbalah's all and lack of congruency when I can do what's right it doesn't even matter to me whether it's Kabbalah Sol or not because because I'm so passionate about it. I want to do it. There's there's the ultimate congruency. I mean, that's what Chassidus teaches us is get congruent with yourself. Mm-hmm. Then things go easy. Mm-hmm. That's the, if you can appreciate and learn to love davening, you'll daven, right? If you can learn to appreciate and love learning, you'll learn. Uh, it's just that simple, right? It's, again, we look at the fitness world. We look at the gym. You know, people hate doing burpees, but if you can learn to appreciate a burpee, you might not like love burpees, but you'll do them because you know that they're important to do. They're healthy for you. So that's how I thought about things. I just didn't have that language back then. Um, I was like, wow, if I can open a Chabad house, I'm never going to hate a day in my work in my life because it won't be work. Right. Monday and, mornings. And you also felt like you were good at it. And I was good at it. And I felt that it was incredibly fulfilling. Mm-hmm. And meaningful mm-hmm. and impactful and I kind of like over the course of the year thought like well, well making money is not going to give me this feeling like I'll enjoy life but I won't have this feeling going into it rationally certainly feels like the better way to go about it um, you know in general I don't think I don't know if I can look back besides getting married but married is not really a rational decision you know, I don't know if I've made a decision that is so impactful in my life, like that, because I've, I've shifted courses personally. But, you know, whenever I make a decision, I try to say if I'm rational about it, then if it works out, great. If it doesn't work out, I can always look back and say, okay, well, at least this is why I did it. Mm-hmm. Like, it just gives me something to work with, you know? So it certainly feels like the better way. The, the downside, I would think, is that um, you're, you're constantly thinking about it. It's not like this blind faith mm-hmm. jump where it's like, okay, I'm in the ocean now. It's too late. Screw Figure it. Figure it out. Smart. Yeah, like I got no choice. Okay, I'm you know I'm just stranded and that's it. That that's my life, right? So, do you a do you? I'll ask you two separate questions. Like, is it is is has that has that ever posed a challenge to you or like as you grow up and um you know we were talking earlier off 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 the microphone about like. Not being old, but getting older, right? Have you have you ever begun to like reconsider that choice, or ha- or has it be- or has it has it become like has that opened up the door to regret, or 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 has it? Let me ask you because I think that's an unfair way to put it because everybody has moments. More like, do you sometimes feel like you wish you had more blind faith going into it? No. No, I have very few regrets. Mm-hmm. And I'm not saying that to try to like, I think I've been, you know, you can see I'm pretty honest. I, I don't have a lot of regrets. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we, we talked about the, the yarmulke story. I had a yarmulke, which I wrote. Remember, it was, the, it was the glue. They would write with that sparkly glue. Right. I remember that. I remember putting Mayach Shalat Al Halev as a, like a t- on my yarmulke. I always liked that idea. At what age? Probably 13, 14. That was before Gates said. Yeah. I guess you weren't such a nobody. I like the idea of of the rationale. Is that like your dad? Is that your is your dad that kind of person? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that was in a way your example, yeah. something you looked up to. Absolutely. Um just think through decisions. No, but do you ever like because I'm sure you go to Kinosim and you have a lot of friends that are Shluchim and you know, I'm not I'm not I'm not looking to like go on some kind of critique of mm-hmm. shlichas now um that's a different conversation but 
I'm sure you have a lot of friends, and I think you said to me earlier, a lot of friends who were more like blind faith jumped in. Mm-hmm. And do you sometimes wish that you had that blind faith? You're happy because no. this is who you are. No. You're a I, rational I, guy. I, I'm, I am who I am. Right. I, I, it would have to be this way. I don't. But I, it t- does, does it make your shlichus harder? I don't think about it that way. Mm-hmm. Um, I see it as a blessing. I see it as I'm open to more th- to different things. Mm-hmm. Um, what what I think is attractive, what I th- what I brag about, what I think Chabad is should brag about is is we're cutting edge. Uh, we're disruptive. We're radicals. I think I think we're losing it. Mm-hmm. But that's a that's, that's a, your part two. That's part two. Um, um, and so I always there's a lot of people. A lot of Lubavitchers are are they have a chip on their shoulder. Uh, there's they're scared in a sense. Um, they've bought into there's only one true path. Mm-hmm. Um. At the very least, like have a have a real respect for others. Um, there's other within, um, and 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 when you're not, I think it's when you don't have confidence in your own, you 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 find others threatening. I'll, I'll tell you for for for. So I. It almost so, it almost sounds like when you it almost sounds like. It's not exactly a synonym, but one of the byproducts of being rational is being honest. Mm. And when you're honest, you don't have the kind of gung ho, you know, blinded, you know, you know, blinders on mentality like nothing else. You because know, you're not going to, you're not going to allow the, the truths to filter in. Right. You right. know, I tell. I, but the, one thing, the advantage of being honest is that when those things peak up you don't have to lie about them because you knew about them the whole time like the decision that you made was not that this is the only thing i could do with my life and that everything else is garbage and you know well you know why would anybody ever want to do anything else no, no, no it's not it doesn't sound like that's what you were saying what you were saying was look i, I went to my, my parent my my, my my father is a Balshuva who's 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 a, who's a professional with a career that he's very proud of um I myself went to Gateshead Yeshiva, which is not a Chabad Yeshiva, and could have taken that path further had mm-hmm. I chosen. I see value in that path, mm-hmm. right? Um, I was thinking to go into business. And so there are all these paths that, I, that, that were open to me and were very, very, like, one step in a different direction, that's where I'm going. Mm-hmm. Yet I chose this path, not because it's the only path, but because it's the best path. And so you don't have that kind of, like... Ignorance is bliss of, but there's not, nothing else. Yeah. But on the other hand, when those other paths present themselves to you, you you're not shocked. Yeah. You don't, you don't have to. You have to. You don't have to lie to yourself. I do Daf Yemi. Okay, we have to cancel this podcast right now. When I <laughs> say that to people, with in Lubavitch, what's the? What do you think the number one response is? Well, do you learn Rambam? Bingo. <laughs> you see, I'm a professional Lubavitcher. But not just do you learn Rambam. Do you learn three Prak and Rama? Yeah, obviously. And <laughs> I, the, the old me... Do you want to answer the question? Just the old fun? me... Yeah, I do learn three Prak and Rama. Okay, fine. <laughs> for the last three years, I did one Perik, and, and now I'm doing three Prak. Um, there's such a... Uh, th- there's this need. It's like the it's like the Lubavitchers need to know that other people give props to the Rebbe. Well, look, it, it's just going to boil down. We could talk about it for endlessly, but to me, and this is why I feel, this is why I, I like the detour that we took. I wasn't expecting it because I had no idea about it, the whole Gates of thing. But I always feel, you know, especially because of what I do for a profession, I always feel it's so much more powerful when it comes out of a story than sure. when it's just like kind of spitballing theories and sure. pontificating. I, I relate to that a lot more personally. I think other people do too. But like, you know, that's the beauty of having been exposed to a to a different world and not just by force for like three, four weeks, but like immersing yourself in that for three years. And you mentioned earlier that they had to, rest- they, 
one of the reasons, one of the beautiful byproducts of you being there was that they learned to respect you, but I'm sure what you also meant was you Mm -hmm. learned to respect them. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there could be differences and there could be serious differences and there could be things where they still think that you're loony and there are things that you think that they're loony, but that doesn't mean you don't respect each other. And, you know, that, that changes so much about how you view your identity and that allows as a, as a Lubavitcher, and that allows so much more honesty about about what Lubavitch identity means. Because now what Lubavitch identity means are the things that really mean something to you, right? You, you've chosen the things that mean something to you. You know, Lubavitch identity can't mean everything. It can't, or it can't be the only thing. It can't be the only identity, right? It has to be a identity. And you've shaped that identity by by forming it for yourself, and 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 or 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 appreciating it for yourself. And you can only do that when you know what else is there and what differentiates it from the other identities, and with respect and honesty. Um, and I think that's a very fruitful kind of takeaway from the conversation. Also, is that um, is that. I'm not, I'm not suggesting that everyone should go to Gateshead for three years, and I don't think you are either. I don't think that's feasible, but I, I, I can't, I can't, you know, I can't tell you how much I've, I've said this to myself and to others over the years where like so much of, so much of our malady, collective malady as, as like Lubavitcher's groping for identity is this lack of honesty that you're talking about. And this like Chabad could be, Chabad identity, Lubavitch identity could be the best identity in the world, but if it's on, the, if it's on, if it's only available to the exclusion of everything else, it's not going to stand up. I um, I take on hobbies. Every it seems like every five six years, I pick up something else, whether it's a hobby or an interest, um, and I've noticed that over the last 20 years, the friends that I've stayed in closest contact with are doing similar things. Similar hobbies? No, no, no. Also doing they're, hobbies. they're also evolving. Ah. Um, mm. That's very interesting. Because, because we're not the same as we were when we were 23. No, nobody is. Um, but some people are. <laughs> but some people are. Some people have not evolved because, yes, because their entire identity was an identity that was chosen for them, mm. right? And so, um, very interesting. I find myself bored mm. in talking to them because they're still having the same conversation they were having, we were having 20 years ago, and I'm not having that conversation anymore. Right. Um, and they think sometimes that you're not having it because, like, you're oof clarity, you think you're better than us. No, no, I've grown up, and it, I don't think that. I'm not. I'm not regretting the conversation I had with you 20 years ago, but <laughs> you're not stimulating. It's 20, to me right it's 20 now. years now. Right, it's like right. like I'm very happy that I had those moments with you, and we argued about who's the better head shliach, and like you know, <laughs> yeah, whatever it is, whatever, <laughs> whatever it that is. was, yeah, and, and like and like, or even it was like, but at, at this, or even if it was like an idea in chassidus, like I'm happy that I had that argument with you then. Or that discussion with you then in that language, right, but for right. the conversation to continue now, right. it's the it's language different... has to be different. It's also like a personal evolution. Like it's, I was talking to a friend of mine who, who's like lives and breathes fundraising, and I was like, I don't want to talk about that with you because right. I don't. It's something I do, but it's not who I am. Right. It, you've made it your identity, but I, I have a friend who who is a friend who has evolved, who who's always been an evolutionary person. Maybe he's somebody for you to podcast. Uh, Barry Farkash and in. in, in in Issaquah, Washington. Oh, okay. And he became a therapist. He's really? still a shleich. He runs a very successful Mysid, but he's a therapist now. Huh. And we were talking the other day, the other a couple months ago, and he said this, he said this word to me, which I really, it made a deep impact on me. And it was very validating, you know, years later, uh-huh. right? Which is, you know, the story of Light and his two daughters and they leave Sedaim, right? And they go out to the hills and the mountains and, uh, and we know what happens, right? They, they rape their father. Um, and it says, the Pusik says that they looked all around and, and there was nothing there, right? It was like Sudaim had been destroyed. And so the Mepharshim say, how, how is it possible? And the answer is, the answer is, is that they, um, 
the father had told them that Saddam was it. Uh, and Saddam just got destroyed. So they're like, oh my God, that's it. There's the, the, the future of humanity begins with us. What an interesting critique of nihilism. And so what ends up happening is, and so his the end of his vart is, is that when you teach your kids that this is the only thing and that thing f- is destroyed, you, you end up having utter destruction. You end up having... The daughter, what the daughters did to the father. Well, this touches a little bit to what we talked about earlier about you going to Gateshead. Not that that's why you went to Gateshead, but there's no question that the few years after Gimel Tammuz Chabad had a very, very cynical few years, you know, or nihilistic few years. As one would expect, it was very difficult times, right? And you were, you were. I was shielded from it. You were shielded from that. But you know, going back to your hobby thing, and we could, you know, we could wrap it up with this, with this, with this conversation. But I mean, that, that's that's definitely, definitely very relevant to the to what we we're discussing earlier. I mean, I, I think about it often as the subjective state versus the objective state. And I was just talking about it with a friend the other day. We're like, you know, there's a famous story of I think it was Rapillo Parcher who heard a mimer. And he has the mimer. I forget which one of the first rebbeim that he has the mimer. The rebbe heard his the way he understood the mimer, and he said, "No, that's not what I meant when I said it." And Rebbe said, "No, but that's how I understood it. Like that 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 part belongs to me, right?" And one of the you know, and this is something that's discussed ad nauseum in in Chassidus with all the mashalim of the rav and the talmud. But the rav has an objective truth, mm. and the talmud has a subjective truth, mm-hmm. and that's always the 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 chasm between the two is the chasm between the objective and the subjective. And I don't know when, and this is definitely something I'd like to get to the bottom of at some point in my lifetime, but I don't know when, but we basically, as a community, we, we, we just, the community, uh, we, we foregoed the subjective state. We were petrified. Of dealing with subjective state. We became petrified. You know, you know that word is an amazing oh, word. Oh, petrified isn't like, it's like, it's we like. Became, we became Undynamic. We became like, set in stone, like like a volcano in Pom- Pompeii. Yeah, s- s- yeah. Right. Well, but it, it was like almost like, or I would I would even say more the word that I that I think of as like we became desiccated almost, mm. or like or just like our whole interior was basically sucked out, and all we were was, you know, basically these hollow outsides that followed the orders given by the subjective truth mm-hmm. because there's this Rebbe who's objective truth like what's even the place for you mm-hmm. you're saying earlier about on Chabad there's the Rebbe and there's everybody else but that, that doesn't make any sense like so I would, if, if there's a Rebbe and there's everybody else then what's the point of me even getting becoming better the next day like from that line of there's a Rebbe and there's everyone else is not to me a very long ways away from and all the Brahma masturbating yeah, yeah. Because like, why, why not? It's because not... like, I'm, what's the difference this way or the other way? And and so you're talking about hobbies. Like, hobbies, you know, on one hand, like, you know, the Babich would say, like, oh, hobbies are still similar. Yeah, whatever. yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe. But let's start with there. And if that, if you want to take, take it up a level, start with hobbies, because that's where you're going to differentiate yourself in a real way because it, it costs time and effort to develop a hobby. That's the thing you discover about hobbies. Yeah, yeah, is yeah. Nobody's born enjoying fly fishing. Right. You got to really learn how to tie knots and it's a pain in the tachas. Right. Massive pain in the tachas. But once you get into it, you can't let go of it. Once you know what that means, that kind of subjective, you know, that dedication, that but that's based on a subjective desire. Okay, now, now pick a hemshech. Okay, and, and shift or use that example of subjective interest and and, and, and shift it shift it to chassidus. And just to end up, I remember when I was in yeshiva very clearly talking to a, a classmate of mine and he had been stopped on the street. We were in old terror and he'd been stopped, stopped on the street by, uh, by a reporter. And like there was, they were doing the survey of young men in New York or something. And the reporter asked him if he has any hobbies. And he said, no, I don't have any hobbies. And he was discussed, do you have any hobbies? I'm like, no, I don't. I learn. I don't have hobbies. I learn. And like, do you think anybody in Yeshiv has any hobbies? I'm like, I never heard of anybody with a hobby. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, I mean, it's a whole different conversation that we could, we would have to have another time. But there's no question that, you, that there is a connection between having hobbies and, and, and really for being comfortable 
either being comfortable with having your own subjective state that is subject to interrogation and to failure and to being wrong, or at the very least, being uncomfortable with not having a subjective state. Yeah. So this is, to me, this is a fascinating conversation or one that I, that I, I get a lot of blank stares <laughs> because, because there's sort of like this, you know, it goes back to that thing that you were saying about, about 30 year olds who, who, you know, that are, that are, that are act like they're 90 because they, they think that's the way it needs to be. Right. Right. Like fitness has to be unfun. Right. It can't be fun. Like you're having fun at the gym. Like that's not fair. Right, it shouldn't I think, be. I don't, I don't even think that's what it is. It's a necessary. I think, feel, I think they feel that if they, for them to intervene in their own fitness, is somehow messes with the whole idea that like God's in control and like life is just how it is. Life, like in yeshiva, there was always this weird kind of contradiction where on one hand we don't care about getting a six pack. But whoever has a six pack is super cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's like wait a second. But I'm not even going in that direction. I was, <laughs> I was going a little bit different with this. But I want to say two things. One is about one of the hobbies that I picked up, and and unfortunately, COVID kind of killed it. Which was I, I got really into like studying about the Holocaust. Mm-hmm. You know, which is something that we weren't taught. It's not part of our curriculum. No. Um, uh, Holocaust and Chabad are not right, very right. Yeah. Because we're Russian. Uh, yeah, yeah. There's mainly, a lot of reasons. Mainly, mainly also because it's complicated. Well, theologically, it's complicated. Yeah, but it was something that I really delved into for a while, um, and, and read. I read a whole bunch of books and, and and really started talking to people about it and, and engaging with it and trying to understand. Um, but I want to get back to hobbies in a minute. But but something that you said earlier, just before, that triggered this, um, which I always liked. And I don't know why it didn't get more play because maybe it's wrong. I don't know, but I liked it. I read this blog back when blogs were a thing. So we're probably going back. It has to be 15 years. Mm -hmm. And the guy writes, he's a rabbi. He writes this blog post and he goes, why? He says, I know Lubavitch. I was around the Rebbe. I know the Rebbe. Like, it's shocking to me that the Lubavitch Rebbe didn't name a successor. How can it be? How are you talking? It, it just doesn't fit with the, who the Rebbe was. He says, I think it was by design. He writes in this blog post, I think it was by design. The Rebbe didn't name a successor on purpose. Why? Because the Rebbe had successors. The Rebbe had thousands of successors. He had all the shluchim and the shluchis. Those were his successors. And he goes on to say, let me explain to you. He says, if you look at Rebbe's, it's like any, it's like any power. When the new guy comes, what is the what does a new king automatically do? They 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 consolidate power. Mm-hmm. In the Hasidic world, what does that look like? Let's look at Ger, new Takanis. Right? He says the Rebbe knew that a new Rebbe would come, would consolidate power, would stifle what he had built with the Shluchim. Mm-hmm. That creativity. That you are my you are me in Hanover, New Hampshire. You are my representative, say all that good stuff. But a new guy is going to come and he's going to he's going to strangle you. Mm-hmm. He's going to demand, he's going to want, he's going to it's not going to it's not going to work with what this unbelievable beautiful thing that I've created with you guys. And the guy writes, he finishes, he goes, that's why I think there's no next Rebbe. Now the Dar Nix and the Dar, you know, whatever they're going to say they're going to say, I don't really care. It doesn't interest me. Um because oftentimes they don't make sense to me. I don't understand. Certain, like I still to the day don't understand why we don't go visit the Kfarim of the Tzemach Tzedek and the Alter Rebbe. And the, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's a dumb fit, but I don't want to go there. A student wrote a blog post about me once. And he writes that Rabbi Gray is the Rebbe in Hanover, New Hampshire. And I remember being totally fine with reading that. I showed it to friends and they like bristled. They were like so uncomfortable with it. I was like, Why? But it's true. Like, isn't this what... Yeah, yeah, but we don't say it. It's like the six-pack without the six-pack. Oh, okay. Right? Like, it's like, we want it, but we're not willing to do anything about it. Yeah, because because it, it there's basically, you know, it, I'm putting it in very academic terms. So it, it kind of kills, it kills the, the vitality of what's going on and, and like how messy it is. But the line of subject and object is something that 
that that we have a very big problem with you know again I'm, I'm to say that that's our issue sounds like 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 we're dissecting a frog in in a laboratory but to me like almost every time I have a conversation about you know what's going on and what's going right and what's going wrong usually when we're discussing what's going wrong it always comes down fundamentally to that question to that mm. issue of subject versus object mm. because whether it's what we were discussing earlier, like the lack of interiority, the 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 fear of developing yourself, like like Tafiemi, so it must be at the Cheshbon of, of Ram. Right, right. Um, you know, so you're you're doing fitness. Wait a second, what's that? That's at the Cheshbon of something else. And you know, this idea that like, if you, obviously you're not at Sadiq, obviously you're you're wasting time with your life, but you're not consecrating it in an hour at the gym. You're just wasting it on the phone following some nonsense but that's okay because it's not a statement of subjectivity it's it's mm. just like a okay i'm not as good as i should be but it's not like you're not celebrating your subjectivity like the mm. other day i got a message from somebody who i haven't seen for years and uh, yeah he like he saw some thing that i wrote or something that i posted about at the gym or whatever and he's like the yvonim in the times of hanukkah would be proud of you <laughs> So so I and then he got then he got offended that I'm like bro like like what's with the bitterness and he's push. like what, and he's like he's like what do you mean I'm yeah. like what do you mean yeah yeah I, I'm 20 years out of yeshiva I, they want I to lob live, grenades and they don't want to take it back no it's yeah. not like I don't live in a world where you calling me a Greek Hellenizer <laughs> is just a joke <laughs> like I'm not in that world anymore we don't we don't throw those kind of terms like you know oh I was just joking no I mean this is real stuff you know and. You know, so whether it's that issue of the the fear of having of like admitting and acknowledging and celebrating and 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 encouraging your interiority, that's an issue. The issue, the the the, the challenge of realizing that the Rebbe has spoken absolute truths, and that and in objective truths, and then in subjective relative terms, everything gets messy in a hurry. And how do we translate the Rebbe's message? into a subjective world without, on one hand, diluting his message and making it all kind of feel goody and modern-y and, you know, whatever, new agey, but at the same time, you know, making it something that we can relate to and something that we can live with and something that becomes vibrant in our lives. It's always going to be that issue. That is the crux of the issue, in my opinion. You know, I, one of the very interesting things that I... That I, what time uh, is it, by the way? It's 12.50. Okay. We have an organization. We have a people that if you were to ask to identify, one, the biggest identifier of a Lubavitcher, of a Chabadnik, is, would be, I would argue, is we are there to challenge people to change their lives like we this is what we do but at some it's it's like even i'm not talking about shluchim i'm talking about this was the rebbe like you're in the airport you're waiting for a flight you see a guy that you go over to a guy excuse me are you jewish put on film why, why are we doing it? yes the mitzvah is important but th there's this whole we re on a college campus what am i what am i here for i'm here to challenge kids to change their lives right mm -hmm. When was the last time we changed our own lives? Mm. Have we ever changed our own mm. lives? And it's not so easy, right? So so you can't become from. Like you can, but you can't become from. You were born from. You're not going to have that that moment of black and white, clear, before and after moment. We're like, okay, I wasn't from and now I am from. It's become fromer, but it's always so I've asked, so, so So for example, so I've asked friends like, okay, have you ever learned just because a new language? Right. Most people will say like, well, hell no. no, hell no, <laughs> no. Well, okay, I know you. You've ne you've always been. You've always weighed 150 pounds, so you never actually had to lose 100 pounds of weight and keep it off. Which, which I would consider that to be life changing. Yes. When when a secular kid who's eating shrimp, and going to baseball games on Shabbos and doing other things, says, "I'm now going to stop eating all these good foods. I'm going to stop engaging with it, and I'm going to literally change my life." Like so, that's what we're trying to. But we've never done it ourselves. Uh -huh. So, so that to me, in part, is where 
there's a lot of reasons why one should do hobbies. It keeps you young, keeps you fresh, it keeps you nimble, it's, it's creating your neural pathways, all that good stuff. Keeps you humble. Keeps you humble, because you're gonna be bad at it. I picked up uh, skateboarding. This oh, might be a new it. thing. Yeah, I saw the video. Um, it's very humbling. Yeah. But the fitness thing, this is, that's like my first love, right? That was like the thing that like, the greatest gift. When did you pick that up? So CrossFit started 10 years ago. Cross, you started CrossFit. Yeah, CrossFit started I, a lot of earlier. I started, I started fitness 10 years ago. Really? Yeah. Until then, no, no fitness. I, I played sports as a kid. Right. But, right. Like I said, but like yeah, like everybody. I then turned. You, then you neglected I, it. I turned 21, 22, right? Got married, moved here, and that was it. it was done. I, I lived. I, I entered into a sedentary lifestyle where I was sitting at my computer, meeting with students. I would go snowboarding occasionally, but I gave that up. I, I did, just decided I didn't like it. And so, at 32 years old. You know, after living here almost for 10 years, I walk in, I go to see my doctor and my doctor's like, this, things are not going in the right direction for you. You know, you're putting on weight. Um, you're, 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 um, you're, um, your diet's terrible. Mm. I was smoking, you know, two, two cigars a day. Two cigars a day. At a, at a, at a certain point. I would sit and smoke a cigar and drink, you know, a liter of Coke huh. over the course of two hours. That was my greatest pleasure. Because you have a beautiful porch. Oh, I did, we didn't have this porch back then. This is, we, we've been in the squad house only for five years. Okay, you had another porch, I'm sure. I had a porch, it's a but... It's a beautiful place to smoke a cigar. As this was, this was, I, um, I wasn't, I wasn't even paying attention to what I was eating. My cholesterol went through the roof. Right. And I go to the doctor, and the doctor's like, you're going to make some changes, or else... And I was like, why? I'm, I'm fine. I feel fine. Like, he's yeah. like, but you're not fine. <laughs> so I had a friend. You had a pretty perceptive doctor. Most doctors don't care about I had that a, age. I had a friend who lived here um, who owned the fitness club, uh -huh. who was a donor, Dartmouth alum. And he said, go see my people at the club. And I was like, ah, that. And the doctor said, go take a walk. You know, for a guy that played, used to play six hours straight of basketball, like, taking a walk. Like, yeah. what did I know? Like, no, those are for old women. Right. Uh, so... About six months went by, and um, I remember it was a Friday afternoon. I was at the liquor store getting probably, I don't know, whatever. And uh, I knew the gym was around the corner. I said, let me go in. I said, we'll pop in, and uh, I meet this guy, Chris Acker. And I said, hey, you know, I'm really good buddies with Joe Ash, and he told me to come in. And so he's like, oh, great. I was like, yeah, just show me around the place, right? So he walks me around this facility, and... Uh, you know, it literally would be like taking an alien and showing him all these books. And like, he was like, I, I don't know what this is, right? I saw machines and I saw more machines and more machines. And I was like, all right, whatever. So he's like, why don't you come back for a fitness consult? Okay, fine. So I come back the next week for a fitness consult. Um, this woman, Cassie, did this fitness consult. Um, and uh, two hours later, she says to me, she says, okay, so you're, you're, I don't see people like you very often. Like you're in a little bit of an anomaly because you either score zero or you score a hundred. You got nothing in the middle. She's like raw strength and mobility. You score crazy off the charts for somebody like you, but you have zero stamina, zero. <laughs> I was like, okay. She goes, you need a personal trainer. I remember those words coming out of her mouth and like, like the walls of, 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 you know, the Philistine walls with, with Shimshon are coming down. I just saw dollar signs just flowing. I knew personal trainer. I don't have that money. All right. I'm not going to pay for that. Like I called, she says, you need a personal trainer. I called up Joe. I said, what are you trying to do to me? You're just trying to make money off me, Joe. <laughs> he goes, well, was that what Cassie said? I said, yeah. She says, I need a personal trainer. I said, so I said to her, I said, why can't you, you just show me how to use the machines? She goes, that's not how that works. Joe says, look, Rabbi, use a trainer. If you feel that it was a total waste of your money, I'll give you back every dollar. I said, okay. So I said to her, I said, give me somebody who will educate me because I'm not going to pay for this in perpetuity. All right. So she gives me this guy. I show up the Wednesday and this guy shakes my hand. He goes, hi, my name's Lochran. And I was like, oh God. There's a guy who has a first name. His last name is a first name. Right. <laughs> it was this big, 
guy. He's this big Gentile. Like, I, it's like, all right. So uh, begins. It, it, that was the beginning of the most beautiful relationship. Um, he's literally my best friend here. Uh, it turns out his wife is Jewish. His kids are Jewish. His son's bris was right there. Right there. That's where the key, that's, that's where the sandik sat. I was a sandik for his son's bris. Huh. I mean, you understand? Like crazy. We started this fitness program for Shluchim. It was him and me. We would talk for hours about this. Has it taken off? It, we, we've had iterations of it. Um, it's changed lives. It has changed lives. Oh. Um, he came in probably a month into our training sessions, and he, he looked really tired. And I said, why are you so tired? He says, well, I was up all night reading about you guys. I said, what do you mean? <laughs> he goes, well, I started reading about the Rebbe. <laughs> and I start, and he says, and I said, Anne, he goes, well, why are you guys all fat? <laughs> I said, what do you mean? He goes, well, I Google image Chabad rabbis. <laughs> she goes, you're all fat. So he says, so you're doing the Lord's work, but you're not taking care of your bodies. Like, how does that? He's like, that doesn't compute. Yeah. So I was like, Lachran, like, you're talking, like, this is amazing. So we, we, we've been like best friends for 10 years. Um, so he we would have like these really intense conversations as we were working out. And I started seeing all these incredible corollaries between um, what I'm learning about. Uh, what, like, I'll give you one example. What is Kedusha? How do you define, what is Kaddish? Kaddish means holy. Okay, well, what does that mean? Separate. Separate. Oh, so, so separate means intentionality. Right. So now all of a sudden, snatching 200 pounds is the most separate movement you can do because you have to be totally focused. If you're uh -huh. not focused, the, the, not only is the barbell not going up, it might go up and injure you dearly. Severely, yeah. And so all of a sudden, you learn how to be super hyper-focused and separate for three, four, five, six, eight seconds. Right. And so to me, that all of a sudden defined what I had learned, been learning about Kedusha for 30 years in yeshivas with the Mashpiyam and the Rosh Hashivas and the Goyin Eoylam who can never explain to me what Kedusha actually is. Mm -hmm. And now a barbell... And a guy explained to me in like this what kedusha is. Look, it, it, to me, it comes back. I mean, look, you you just opened up a Pandora's box of like I, I could talk for as anybody that knows me knows I could talk for three hours now about this topic. Um, I've been doing it for much less than you have, but like I've I had the same kind of experience, and you know of. of I wasn't really guilted into it by my doctor, but it was, you know, a cousin of mine actually who was very, very much older than me, very, very overweight, told me that he had started to work out just to be able to do some basic functions, like to just walk not, up a set of to stairs. Basically, to basically not p pass away. Right. What was scary to me was is that I had pictures of him at my age where he was skinnier than me. And he told me, like, it doesn't just happen one day. It, it, gra it happens gradually. And, uh, you know, as I've since learned, it has to do with decreasing muscle mass and all mm -hmm. kinds of things that we... Mm -hmm. But I don't, you know, so it kind of got me into it. But then once I got into it, I had the same experience that you have. All of a sudden, you begin to see things in a much more visceral, immediate way that, like, your whole life, you were grasping for it. Like, what does this mean? And all of a sudden, you see it. You see it in the, you see it in the flesh, literally. Um, but to, to kind of tie it into our general conversation... What what I love about it is how humbling it is, mm -hmm. how humbling it is, and that does tie into what we were discussing earlier. You know, like the the, the mentality of like, well, why do I don't need to work out. That's what goyim do, or you know, that's what, are you a bodybuilder, or like you know, do you learn Rambam kind of thing? Like you're 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 assuming somehow that you're higher than this thing that millions of people need to do just to function. They've come to a realization that. For them to function, they need to develop some basic level of strength and some basic level of mobility and some basic level of heart strength, right? And that's it's a it's a non it's a non-negotiable for them. You've decided sum summarily that you don't need it. Based on what? Right? You don't have a heart like everybody else does? Like you don't have you don't have muscles like everybody else does? No, you've just chosen to ignore this reality that's staring you in the face right and that goes back to what we discussed earlier like if somebody like to me it's and and, and add, a, add one more layer to it like i have friends who work in yeshivas and, and teach in yeshivas and you'll bring up the idea of bringing it into yeshiva and they're like well we're afraid if we bring it into yeshiva 
maybe it'll take away from Bahrim, like learning or whatever. And it's like, how weak is your learning? A, how weak is your learning that you're scared that a little bit of physical activity is going to somehow throw the whole balance off? And B, how can you expect young teenagers to at all move about in their life and make, like you said, make changes in their life, make improvements in their life on this lofty spiritual level when they've never experienced that on a much more basic level? Like, how are we skipping 10 steps here? But so I don't want to go into a whole screed about fitness. I just think it comes back to this, what you're talking about earlier, that, you know, what I've learned and, you know, maybe it's ironic because I don't think anybody has ever called me a humble guy in like, I don't think that's been a strength of mine. <laughs> you know what I mean? I, I certainly have never thought of myself as a humble guy, but life has taught me humility. And um, this, you know, weightlifting in particular has taught me humility in a very like, visual, uh, physical way. It's like the fact that you think that you should be able to lift X amount of weight, go tell that to the metal. It doesn't care. Right? What you have in your head, it doesn't care. Like either you can or you can't. And you're either going to respect the weight or you're not. And it forces you to become a lot more cognizant of your limitations. It forces you to become a lot more cognizant of the cost of change. And it forces you to be to to become more cognizant of of the choices you make. Yeah. And that to me is is a perfect metaphor for for the advantages of humility when you directed towards identity uh, and for me I think that's a great way to end unless you want to add something yeah it, it just it, I think it full circle goes back to this idea of well-roundedness you know how we t- talked about and how we're trying to be well-rounded um, learn it comes down to appreciation it comes down to appreciating something I'm not, I'm not saying everybody has to lift like I lift no. but people need to appreciate and and, and there are a lot of worthy causes. There are a lot of things worthy of appreciation. And, and as humans, the more things we can appreciate, the better off we'll be. You know, uh, you look at issues in the, in the Jewish world. I mean, like Aguna, for example. I mean, that's a major issue, but yet most people don't appreciate it because mm-hmm. it doesn't affect them. My marriage is fine, whatever. But if we can learn, and, and, that's, and that's what this is. This is about being a lifelong learner. Uh, a lifelong student, learning to appreciate things. Um, you know, I sort of think about it is is if you're not, you've got a gun, and it's got a chamber for one bullet. My gun's got thirty chambers. You know, I, I, I'm better prepared. I just see that as that, and and so my sub again, it goes back to that subjectivity that we've talked about. Um, but if your identity is only one thing and you've sold out on that it's gonna be really hard Mm. and so it's more work and uh i I see that you know i evangelize on these things uh you know not so much crossfit anymore but like physical fitness and i and i've seen a difference since i've started 10 years ago and today and what's going on in our in in our community it is a shift in the right that in the right direction um so i'm hoping I'm, i'm hopeful that this shift can happen in other places also so yeah, I'm in. I'm in. Thanks anyway, for uh, this was this was great. I had a blast. Doing this. We're gonna yeah. do it. We're gonna do it again. We, 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 we have to. We're gonna do it again. The music for this podcast comes from the album Repentance Doors by Oren Sor Nadav Bachar and is used with their permission.